Welcome to the 57th edition of Podcaster with Michael Charles Beretti. Welcome, Michael Charles. Hey, Doran. Nice to see you again. Great to be on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're welcome. Um, uh, in a minute, we'll come to why I invited you. But first, introduce yourself. Uh, we know your name, but who are you? What do you do in daily life? Um, please explain. Sure. So, Michael Charles Borelli, Regulatory Compliance Specialist, and I co-run AI and Partners with my business partner, Sean. AI and Partners is a professional services firm for companies subject to the EU AI Act, and we uh, help companies achieve regulatory compliance. Uh, you mentioned just now the, the European uh, uh, EU AI Act, and that's exactly the reason why I invited you, because we're, we're, we're closing in on a, um, the finalizing the, the, this law, and, and it will be implemented, and it has a huge impact. And um, my opinion is that a lot of companies and, uh, and developers have no idea about the actual impact of it and, uh, and, the, con uh, and the consequences. Uh, we had a pre-talk, uh, discussing this. Actually, we didn't have a pre-talk. We had a, just a discussion to get to yeah. know each other. And the conclusion was we should record a podcast about this because this is huge. Um, so here we are doing that. Um, please explain to people who are not aware of what is in the European, uh, or the EU AI Act. What does it, uh, entail? What does it mean for companies or, and what does it mean for companies that develop software with AI? Well, as you've alluded to, it's probably one of the most significant legislative developments in European Union history. And since the GDPR, um, it's the world's first comprehensive law on AI and attempts to regulate the safe and secure development deployment of AI. So it's, it's pretty significant. And in the backdrop of open AI and the, the, you know, the, the takeoff of generative AI this year, it's, it's going to be uh, one of these moments of history where we're going to look back and think, my goodness, I was part of that. What it means for companies is that any interaction or any, any European nexus they have, so any de developers based here or marketers or clients bring potentially brings them in scope with respect to the use development or the deployment of AI or any interaction with it. So to use a silly example, if you're a US fund manager and you have using AI to help with the investment decision making process and you manage a portfolio on behalf of European clients, you're in scope. Or let's say you're a, an Australian mining company and then you, uh, you use AI to help manage the supply chain and you export to Europe. Yeah, guess what? You're in scope. So similar to GDPR, it is extraterritorial. Um, and companies really need to take this seriously amidst the flurry of regulations. And uh, I, one could admit some of them are quite, you know, complex and seemingly uh, some of them may not be as directly applicable. This is this is driven by this is a market driven by the recent uptakes be, and people have likened the uptake of AI to to the Internet. And if we view it from a perspective of if data is the new oil, as many such as Goldman Sachs have coined, then AI is is the combustion engine, and that is a phrase which has been coined by Sean. And if you say AI is the combustion engine, which I find an interesting uh, 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 logic, um, th th and then take that to the companies that actually develop AI. Um, and, and, and take that thought, okay, you have oil and you have a combustion engine. Uh, what are the developers then in this uh, equation? Great, great you, question. You understand my question? I do. I, it's a great question. So if I understood it, developers would be the ones who are primarily accountable. Um, so they would be what's termed or be, be on the umbrella term of a provider. And a provider covers the developer and a deployer. So you could have someone developing the AI system and then you have the company who deploys it both would be uh, value chain actors. Um, so the providers are the main uh, people affected by the regulation. Now users, for example, let's say a business also have obligations. So for example, if, and forgive me if I didn't cover this initially, it's a risk-based approach, approach to regulation, similar to AML, for those of you who know. So you, you have to risk classify your customers. And it, depending uh, AML, for the people who don't know, is anti-money laundering legislation. Exactly. And you know, you... The, Sorry. The, no, 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 it's fine. You have the, um, the, the, the term KYC. Everyone probably loves or dislikes that. Know your, know your customer. 
know your AI system, KYAI. So you have to know the risk level, which determines the obligation. And if you're a user of an AI system, if you're using one that's unacceptable, you can't use it. So you're you're liable for that. Equally, if a, if an AI system is high risk, such as a, potentially using biometric uh, categorization, then you would have to, you would be able to request information from the provider, say Microsoft, OpenAI, etc., to uh, to show you how the information, what information relate, relates to an AI system, and what data it's been trained on. So interesting. So uh, let's say your company. Let, let's let, let let's try an example. Let's okay. say you have a company that gives you a company phone, an employee, right? Yeah. And the screen of the phone opens with facial recognition. Are we then talking about? Uh, and, and it seems fairly simple because the, a lot of phones do this, right? Yeah. Or fingerprint. Um, that's biometric. That would be. Is that would that be considered uh, uh, an AI system, right? To to somewhere extent, is your face is being stored. I I think that personally, um, or oh, sorry, it could be said that the uh, that would very much be covered under high risk categorization, and the the developer and deployer of the AI system that is used in in the device uh, by the manufacturer and used by the user. Um, would have to have that uh, AI system identified and risk classified under the EU AI Act, because. But if you think if you think about it, that the company just gives a phone to his staff and they yeah. secure it, uh, you know, their data on the phone with their face. But by doing that, they introduce a new risk, and uh, I don't think companies are actually aware of this. No, I and this is just a simple example. It is a very, but it's a brilliant example, and I'm very glad you brought that one up. But it's. Um, it is because if they if they it's all part of supply chain or vendor management so in the same things to, in financial services you had uh, when mifid 2 came into play you had the third party due diligence forms where you had to collect base identifying info, info, sorry information on your products so <laughs> managed to get that one out um and then you would have to make a risk assessment of whether you onboard that vendor so when they're looking at vendors they would have to say right okay we're looking at this and the, the ai um, the AI systems would just be an additional categorization. I'll give you a real life example, actually. A, a good friend of mine is a financial crime director for a major um, Japanese investment bank. And people are coming in to, to him left, right, and center saying, hey, can we do this AI project? Can we do this? And he is fundamentally saying, no, I'm not signing off on this because I do not understand the risk. I don't know where this data is coming from. I don't know who's developed it. And I don't know who's interacting with it. So if a company is just, you know, um, ultra vire handing out phones and not really paying attention, they are taking such a big risk that the reputational risk alone could be, you know, one for CEOs to take very seriously. Um, yeah, yeah. And, but my, and this is my personal opinion and, and, and please, uh, um, uh, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but um, my, my personal opinion is that on sea level, or actually on management level, there is very little actual understanding what AI or even LLMs or, or any or machine learning, or the whole realm, realm of, of uh, what you could cover under AI, they have no clue in, in what system and in the intricate of a lot of system it's actually hidden. A lot of the system they're using in the back end, there's already AI. If you if you buy something on on Amazon, there is AI in the background running, telling you, oh, there's a th this would be a good suggestion uh, based on data analysis and, and and other stuff, and and automatically creating a profile view and based on that, blah 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 blah. Um, and the same with uh, retargeting on uh, online uh, with advertisement. Um, if your company is online advertising, you are using AI. Or the company you are using to do that to retarget your uh, your customers online that is using AI. They have no idea, but that would fall under in, in uh, the way you're explaining it. That would fall under the European AI Act, right? Potentially, yes. But even if it didn't, you'd still have to take sufficient means to demonstrate that it wasn't an AI system. And the way the way that oh, so, so 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 hold on, hold on. Hold, Michael, hold on. You're saying something really important here. You said that even uh, you have to prove it's not AI. Yes, comply or explain principle. Is is that? Uh, oh, so you you have to basically in your system landscape, 
you have to understand what is AI and what is not AI. And you need to determine that um, uh, in the intricates of the system you use, if it's not something you built yourself, or so it's from a supplier, they are not using AI or anything similar to AI, or that could be considered AI or AI-ish. Um, so you need a, a statement from your supplier saying, we are not using AI or anything related to it in terms yeah. of liability. I think, you know, there's, um, again, the the legal take on this will obviously differ in ju different jurisdictions, but I think common a common or harmonized approach will be, look, this is the AI landscape. We have X amount of systems and we can demonstrate this because if, and the reason is, if you don't, if you didn't know what the landscape was, you wouldn't have any means to challenge it. So in, in, in a court of law, potentially it could be, okay, this is reasonable. We don't think, however, the landscape at the moment is AI is ubiquitous. Everyone knows it is everywhere and it can be demonstrated. So if you were, if a company was to even infer or imply that, yeah, we don't, we're not using AI and without taking sufficient means, that is a huge risk because of the fact that it is ubiquitous and, um, any, any, even if you let's say, for example, you're using Microsoft and then you, think, you don't think you're using anything and then Microsoft rolls out all these, um, features that have co-pilots AI enabled and they update their terms and conditions to say, this is AI. And if you ignore that, that's effectively akin to gross negligence. Uh, uh, it's, it's funny. You should bring up Microsoft because uh, um, I've been following what they're doing. And, and there's now two companies, Microsoft and I think Anthropic, I'm not sure. But they're, they're, they stated that uh, if you get a lawsuit for using their uh, 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 AI and uh, there's copyright infringement or something like that, and, um, and there's that is small print, uh, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, then they will pay for the law, legal fees to defend yourself. In my opinion, um, and, and maybe from where you're standing, it's different. In my opinion, if a company tells you, oh, you know, if you get sued, we'll pay for it because uh, we understand it's a risk, but we need to have these lawsuits to, to, but basically that's what it is, to prove we're right. You're a guinea pig. Um, and from a corporate risk perspective, you don't want to be a guinea pig because your, your, your risk is so high because if you didn't use it in the proper way or it put a, one of the levers uh, left and then they said you should have put it right, then they don't pay for your legal fees. That's one. And if it, what, what if you lose? Um, and you did do copyright infringement and you get sued by New York Times because New York Times is now suing OpenAI. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the Getty Archive is suing DALL-E, right? Um, but, but what if they start going to the customers? If they don't win at OpenAI, they go to the users, which you were mm. saying, you know, if you uh, apply it, what if they go there? Then you're in trouble. Well, it's a risk based if you don't understand what you're doing and they... yeah it's um so so so, so do you feel that having having said all this that um no no let, let me ask that question differently how should ceos or or boards of directors and management should approach this to manage these risks and understand these risks um, because they are inherent and it's developing continuously. It's not, it's, it's not a, it's not today it's X and tomorrow it's also X. Now it's today X, tomorrow it's Y. Um, because the technology also develops. How should they approach this? So I, I'm, my views may differ from others, but I think they should approach this as if it was a new business function. So you have your standard enterprise functions of finance, marketing, etc. I think they should have one named AI and have a whole, risk subdivisions within that such as risk management such as cybersecurity, because it is too big it is too big a phenomenon to um to to handle in isolation because if you sorry not handle uh, in a comp comp compartmentalized way because if you try and shoehorn it under the departments you have the allocation of responsibilities um accountability and all that stuff gets quite mixed and we've seen how that's worked or we've seen how that's manifested post uh, 2007 crisis um, because if the, if it's akin to the internet which we truly believe it is and the internet is a global phenomenon it's not a it's not an asset it's 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 almost a, a philosophy a product um, a process everything how on earth can you not um, tackle this and I know I may be my views may be quite uh 
um, robust in these things, but I think it does need to be taken. And if you take global leaders, you know, they've been meeting systematically over the past few years to, to tackle this. And there's a great book by a, man, a, chat, a man called Mustafa Suleiman, founder of Inflection AI and part of Google DeepMind. It's called The Coming Wave. And this is The Coming Wave. And this is... What, wasn't he in an interview on BBC or in England? Wasn't he in an interview uh, in England on BBC or uh, another English channel? Yeah, yeah, he was. He's, uh, I, I believe he's Cambridge alumni as well. Um, so he's... He's, he knows what he's talking about, but he, he in, one of the things he refers to is every single revolution in human history, and I, I know this is, I'll loosely link this back, has been underpinned by general purpose technology. So the industrial revolution, you had the steam engine, you had different ways of making production. Here you have AI, which is the general purpose technology. So if you, if businesses don't have a dedicated corporate function and processes and division, whole divisions, um, managing this, then they're going to face serious issues. I mean, take lead by example, the European Union is actually setting up its own AI office in a similar fashion to how the European Data Protection Supervisor and European, European Data Protection Board functions. So I think if a company was to diverge from those, then it would be fairly odd. So basically what you're saying, if, if you're taking AI and the rules and regulations seriously, Um, and not so much because of the rules, but because you want to excel and use it in the right way and, and eventually, um, to, to improve your company and your productivity and making money and having happy, uh, uh, employees and happy customers. And, and it's not one, it's all of them together. It's not one or the other, in my opinion. Um, then they, they should have, basically you should have in the board, uh, your chief AI officer. That's what you're saying. And that should tr yeah. trickle down in the company. Yes. And it's, uh, sorry, it just came to me. It's like, that, that's actually what you're saying. You, you read my mind there, it seems, because uh, you have chief data officers. And again, it shouldn't be conflated with the chief data officer. I think you need a, a demarcation between a CDO, chief data officer, and a CAIO, chief AI officer, because the responsibilities are too different. I mean, it's, use the Sean's um, oil and combustion engine thing. They're two very different things. Yeah, I understand. And, and, and part of the problem is, is that uh, as with data, it runs through all the, all the functions. It's not a just, it's, it's not a column. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a horizontal that literally runs and is, is, is present in, well, it's omni, in the end, not, not, not right now, but eventually it will be om omnipresent in every corner of your company once well, it like gets, blood. you know, uh, it's starting to be used. Sorry, it's like? It's like blood, like data is like blood. It's like the blood runs through yeah. the arteries and it powers the human body. So, um, yeah, it's, it, and if, if you take it further and you consider humans as um, algorithms, which we are, then it's almost an analogous comparison. Interesting, because, um, um, Uh, so basically, um, um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if you know the statement by Henry Mintzberg. It's organizational management, and it says uh, structure follows strategy. If you build a company, then um, you first need to understand where you're going and how you want to get there, and then you, you look at the structure of the company uh, in order. Does that facilitate you know, how, where I want to go and how I want to get there? And if it doesn't, I need to change, change the structure. But a lot of companies do it the other. We have this structure and then they build yeah. the strategy and they don't change the structure and they, they don't succeed. Um, uh, so things need to be in the right order. And basically you're saying, um, uh, so what we're saying is if a company starts building on an AI strategy and they should implement AI in their strategy somewhere to be, because if they don't, they'll fall behind. You get like the Kodak effect or other companies that right. understand well, there's yeah. innovation, but just... And not implementing and not experimenting and not understanding that at some point there is this lever that you need to do, uh, go up or down to change the way you work. Um, and whether you like it or not, but customers are going to demand it because we know if, if there's AI available or, well, I'm from the world of uh, chatbots, conversational AI. Um, and we know that at some point chatbots are going to be so good, especially if you use generative AI in a proper way. 
that they are so much better and faster than any human can be. Yeah. And so if there is a case where you don't need a human or it's at a moment, you just, I don't want to talk to anyone, just want to get the answer. Just, you know, I'm going to ask the question like, like uh, Google Bard or, or chat GPT, you know, ask a question yeah. and I get an answer. And, um, but it shouldn't matter how you ask it should understand you and give, still give the right answer. So that's still a little problem with the prompting. However, um, that is the point you need to understand. Uh, I need a lever for a lot of the things. A lot of people, not everybody, uh, will use that and they want to change because actually the service is better. And for the really difficult stuff or the emotional stuff, you might want to have a person handling that, but then they actually have the time to do that and not be on the clock. Say, I only have two minutes for you because uh, that's my performance, blah, 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 blah. Um, yeah. So, and I think if you, if you don't have that in your strategy, uh, then you don't start diverting budget to it and you don't start learning because that's the, I, I think that's also the part that you said and um, correct me if I'm wrong. I understood that while saying that, okay, we need a chief AI officer, you actually need an AI function in your company if you're big enough. Or if you're not big enough, you need to have a, a company that helps you do that, um, uh, an external company. But uh, you need to develop this knowledge, this, this this core of knowledge and experience in your company because yeah. it, it's going to be in the core of everything you do. And if you don't have that, there's no way you can control it or be compliant because you have no clue of what you're doing. Is that correct? That is correct. And I think a great example of this to use... Uh, that's what companies are already doing already. So you look at some of the big firms like PwC or KPMG or Accenture, they've developed what's called as AI centers of excellence. So basically a centralized entity or hub that has all the resources, um, technical, operational, financial, and otherwise to enable, to enable employees to learn how to use, um, yeah, a, AI and develop it and answer their, any queries. Now that's sort of a, um, Ah, that's sort of a proxy for an AI division, but it's slightly different. So I still think they need an AI division, but that can that can obviously interact with the AI center of excellence, um, and uh, because companies need, need to have this. You know, I think you say the same way. Take for example AI literacy, which is one of the requirements in the EUA Act, is the AI equivalent of financial literacy. Now, if you don't have financial literacy, which most people OECD studies have shown that people consistently in developed economies are struggling with then the same thing can be shown for 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 AI. So um, I agree with you there. I think companies need to, to invest and take this very seriously. And if we if we if we're truly at the start of a wave, which Mustafa Suleiman believes, then we need to de dedicate a lot of resources to this. But that the obligation is not always on the company. The employee has to take their ownership, responsibility, and accountability, and train themselves because um, AI is not going to wait for anyone. But here's an interesting thing. You say an employee needs to train himself and understand and study and, and, and do stuff. But at the same time, um, I know examples in Holland where uh, companies say, well, you cannot use AI uh, in the company for security reasons because we don't know where the data is going. We don't know this. We don't know the quality. We don't know what it's using. And we might be infringing on copyright. I know Dutch municipalities are saying that. And even they said that, having said that, employees are using it and and the results are being used within the municipalities or companies or whatever so uh if you look at it from a risk perspective they're saying the right things but employees are, are just using it anyway um and uh, so employees sometimes want to train themselves but from a company perspective it's not a good idea it's like the the, the samsung example i don't know if the with the software i don't know if you remember that where the secret code ended up in uh um, open AI. I think there's been, do you remember that? That was, uh, I don't remember that one specifically. Sorry. I don't remember that one specifically, but I, I get your point. Um, but I so it's, there's this, this, you know, it's, it's, um, it's like sanding. It's, 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 it's rough. Um, it, it's conflicting. You, you want it to be safe, but it's not, um, you want to comply to the rules, but, uh, you can't, um, so, so we're sort of between a rock, a hard, a rock and a hard place. How do you say that? Um, it's just stuck in the middle. Yeah, it's the uh, taking the leap of faith across the chasm of uncertainty to to uh, 
that's how I sort of phrase it. But, uh, you know, the you have these forces which are driving people forward. So pressures on companies to continue to improve productivity, reduce costs and employ and the employee has the ability to or has the pressure to, to learn and upskill, you know, and I think, yeah, we're stuck in the rock between a hard place, but that it's a dynamic. It's not it's not static. That is a dynamic sort of relationship that will that will that will evolve. Uh, but the the underlying flow, like the tide of the tide of a wave is um is flowing towards ai and that's why a lot of they said the oecd you had rishi sunak with his uk national ai safety summit last last year with then non-legally binding guidance and so on and so forth if people can't see what they have to do there's there's not much more that the evidence is out there it's if you choose to ignore it or choose to look you know and how ultimately you can take horse to water can't make him drink so people have to take Take the uh, and see it's that. actually uh, 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 sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, that, that that makes a lot of sense. No, no, that's there was a delay on the on the uh, uh, the internet. Uh, thank you, thank you, internet. Um, uh, having having said that, so if you look forward, um, w when is this law uh, going to be implemented? W what is your expectation, or is there already a, a date set? Great question. So the with the political agreement was uh, reached last month. So effectively, it will come into force in uh, in 2024, and it will apply from 2026. So that means that um, there's a two year transition period that starts this year. What we expect is the final text to be released by the end of this month, if not close thereafter. Um, and then with it uh, being published in the European Official Journal of the European Union. So the similar to GDPR, you have the two-year transition period. You need to get your ducks in a row as soon as possible. And uh, with the complexity and the number of AI systems, this is probably going to be more resource intensive than GDPR. So if you were a company considering uh, AI right now, um, or implementing AI in, in one shape or form. And let's uh, take a simple one that if you uh, want to create a chatbot that uh, for your customers that uses generative AI and, um, um, and, and that would be bound by this law, right? Or by this regulation. Am I correct? A chatbot. So, be, yep. and it's a low risk and depending on what it does, but let's assume it's it's it, it forget about the, the the risk levels so how does a company that is looking at doing that and here's the interesting thing it does not apply only to companies that are situated in the EU it is also companies that actually deliver services to the EU from outside of the EU right am i correct that is correct so 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 uh, companies should be aware even if you're not situated in the EU supplying services or, or products to the EU and then using AI, you're bound by these laws or by these yes. laws. Yes. Um, so th that's an important thing. Um, having said that, back to the, the question at hand, if you're a company considering doing that, and it's a, it's a simple example, um, wh what should they do now? How should they approach this? Um, because we've discussed in, in, in our earlier discussion, that's why we, we, we got to this, um, that if you implement software, it should be compliant by design. That, that is, um, it, it, it's such a less of a headache. It should be shut, shut, uh, so, uh, less of a headache. Um, because if, if your software is already compliant with the EU regulations, then, um, you need to look at how you're using it, but, but the basics are in order, right? So yeah. th th that is my opinion. So you should, um, but there's so much out there, which is not, I mean, 99% uh, of the LLMs are not uh, compliant with the EU AI Act by default. So anyone using open AI in their business right now is not compliant mm. by definition, right? So how should the company approach this? Well, I think it'd be and, and, and we don't want to slow down innovation, right? That's the important yes. part. We, we know needs, cause that, that, that's the, the, the weird dilemma. That's also what the EU says. No, no, we're not slowing down innovation. There's a lot of space there. So how do you comply on one end, but innovate on the other end and, and, and not get huge costs after that? 
because that's that's the part I would worry about if I was a CEO. It's like, okay, I'm spending a shitload of money now. Uh, I'm going to have to do that again if we're not compliant. So how can we be sort of pre-compliant before we actually have to? Great question. Take it away. Great question. Um, I would say... So draw, draw Diff- it. Difficult to answer. No, adopt a principles first approach. So, and this would apply whether you're developing a new product or an existing. So if I take both examples in isolation, if you're developing a new product, make sure that before yeah. you, so you've got the roadmap, you've got the product features outlined and the MVP, etc. include the compliance and regulatory aspects in it as well, which include the risk classification. And if you know it's high risk, then putting all those measures in place, such as a risk management system, quality management, etc. Now, with respect to existing, if they don't comply, uh, they will be pulled off the market and um, or and or fined um, and you could suffer reputational damage. So, yeah, a CEO is going to face costs, but it's, it's a question of do I face lower cost today or bigger cost in the future plus risk of reputational damage? Um, how they do that mechanically? Get the uh, get um, you know a trusted third party vendor to come in, s- scan your environment, see how many AI systems you have, and do a risk classification. Because the classification then determines how much work you have. So that in uh, that shows what the level of damage, if any, there is, and how if you can de-risk it. So if you know, for example, if you did a risk assessment, it was high risk for ABC then you uh, consulted a lawyer or a um, professional services firm and they said, we can reduce the risk if you uh, do X, Y, Z, then there's a, there's a clear path to de-risk. If it's clear that you can't de-risk, then you have to take different precautions, which depending on the risk level will determine the level of uh, resources required. I hope, I hope that answers your question though. Yeah, it, it, it does in a way. And, and um, it also raises a question. Now, if you're in a company that wants to apply or you're in a department and you're developing a new service or a new product and you want to use a, a software component or something that uses AI, let's say a chatbot, um, my understanding is, and uh, you see, you also see that in the sales cycles, that because there's such little understanding of what, what they're actually doing and the, and the, the future uh, good things and bad things, so the risks, of course, that that it takes them a lot of time to decide and allocate money, et cetera, et cetera. And then still they 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 sort of um, are slow to decide. Um, having said that, if you're an employee and you're trying to, you know, you're, you're under stress to lower cost or improve service, Let, let's focus on improving service because yeah. I think that's that should be more important than the lowering cost because if you deliver good service and you do that with technology, eventually your costs are going to be lowered. Not in the beginning, but eventually. Um, so how do these employees of, of these companies, uh, what should they do to give... Uh, board level or management, this, this level of comfort, uh, cause the EU AI, it's not official yet, but it's going to be, um, give them this level of comfort that they can say, okay, I can with this feeling of comfort and, and, and peace and quiet, we can decide we can do this. We know we're not pouring money into this, this pit. We understand that we're creating value. Um, and once this law goes into effect, well, of course it affects us. But we have the level of confidence where we can say, okay, no, no, not to worry about it. We took all the steps we needed to take, even though the law wasn't implemented yet. We did every measure needed to be taken. We already took. So what should they, if you write a proposal to your board to ask for investment and to do a project, what, what should you say? What, should, how do you give them that comfort? That I, and it, and it needs to be true, right? And it's no fakes. No fakes, um, no deep fake as well. Um, I'd say use the latest version. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> use the, thank you. Uh, use the latest version. Sorry, of the text. Use the latest version of? Use the latest version of the text and benchmark your requirements. Uh, sorry. I... So, for example. Yeah, but, uh, um, okay. If I give you an example, go on, go on. It'll help provide. So, we've spoken with some European. Um, angel investors and venture capitalists and they 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 know of the upcoming regulations they know how long these sales cycles take process and funding requirements so they've some of them have actually stipulated to startups if you want funding you must state in your application how you are complying or intend to comply with the requirements from day zero 
So by the time you get the funding, we know that our investments are secure because it is time passes very quickly. And if we know what 80% of the requirements are today, which near enough we do, uh, subject to any last minute changes, then yeah, you it's very wise to be forward thinking and to disclose, okay, we, we want to do this project and it complies with these aspects of the EUA Act because of this. And here's the evidence. So almost, um, I think an acting or a theatre, you'd call it method acting. Um, uh, well, that's an interesting uh, analogy, uh, but but l let's be honest. Um, uh, I've tr I've looked through and I read part of the legislation. Um, some of it is actually uh, quite clear, but it wasn't written for a fifteen-year-old or a twenty-year-old. If you don't know shit about AI, reading this European AI Act is like I don't know. It's it's gibberish. It's, it's so, mm. sorry to say for the people who wrote it, um, it's high level, which, which is I understand and. Um, and that's what we said uh, earlier um, uh, in our in our earlier talk that um, compliance is all about communication and making people understand what what they're doing and why they're doing it and what the end result uh, should be or could be and what if you don't um, uh, and it should be uh, not in a threatening way but in a positive way because if you understand it's it's contributing in a positive way you're much more likely to comply. Then, um, uh, you, and if you understand you get punished, if you don't do it, that is sort of, I, I don't know, it's psychological. Um, mm. ha having said that, how do we make, uh, help people on the floor understand, um, um, what it entails? So, uh, l l let me give you a simple example. I is there, and I didn't see it in the, in the, in the regulation and I didn't see it out there anyway yet. A, a simple, if you're on the floor designing a chatbot with generative AI. Okay. Let's assume that, that take that as an example. Um, th th there's nowhere, nobody gives me a checklist and says, okay, these are the, uh, the boxes you need to tick in order to start before you start. So this is what you need to discuss with your supplier. And if, uh, or you need to have your supplier, uh, tick these boxes. And if they can't, you cannot work with them because you know somewhere down the line you'll be in trouble. Because uh, when you do the risk assessment, uh, mm. one of these boxes or a few of these boxes won't be ticked. Not being ticked means there's an inherent risk you don't want to have. So um, um, sh shouldn't there be like comprehensive checklists or simple stuff that people understand and they can work with? It's like the, the pre-flight -ch pre um checklist if you you know if you're an airplane what pilots do or in an operating theater you know when they say okay does do all the machines work do are they calibrated do we have all the instruments is everybody there blah blah is it the right patient is it the right operation you know what i mean i completely so pre-flight check for people starting to implement ai completely agree with you and i think the example you raise is fantastic because the the pre-flight checks is enabled is, is a risk mitigation or even a risk prevention exercise i think the actual idea of a checklist was actually coined by uh, john hopkins university so what they were doing is they realized that a lot of surgical procedures were resulting in a lot of um um i think blood transfusion issues or some a lot of infections were carrying because they were using dirty scalpels because people guess what weren't cleaning them after conducting operations however the implementation of a checklist enabled them to yeah clean the equipment do so before they operated on the patient they made sure the environment was clean the same process should be applied here so you know before you deploy a system in the using assuming or in this case an ai application as a product you follow a rigorous checklist to make sure all these checks are carried out so you minimize that risk as much as possible if it worked for airlines and it worked for hospitals it can work for ai well, it, it's it's also how armies operate. They have standard operating procedures, and they train that, mm -hmm. and uh, and they know what happens if they don't comply. Then they introduce a a, a risk they don't want. <clears throat> so, having said, but I haven't seen any of these checklists. They're not around. I mean, and the EU is definitely not going to make them because there's so many. Sorry, we've got a few. Actually. Say that again. We've got a few of these. Uh, we've so. Been uh, would you be willing to share a few simple ones? Uh, I, I post them under the, uh, I will post them on the, um, under the podcast, uh, make them available for the people uh, uh, who listen to the podcast and, and that they understand what they need to do. Because um, it kind of worries me 
if you look at the, the conversational AI business, that um, there's a lot being implemented right now and, and a lot of there's good stuff and there's bad stuff. And we know a lot of companies poured a lot of money in there and they'll be very disappointed um, at some point. And that means a setback for the, 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 the business and for the, the, the evolution of w- what we're doing. So um, I would love to see everybody in the business um, um, starting to apply certain standards um, before they deploy. And if you do that, it'll, it'll trickle down to the suppliers because they understand, you know, in order to sell, they need to have this checklist. It's like, okay, we already ticked these boxes. We saved you time. Here, here you are. And yeah. by that, they're liable. Not, you understand you're, you're pushing down the risk down the, the supply chain. And that's actually what you said before. And you've, you've perfectly articulated it. There. W- would you guys be, uh, willing to sup- yeah. Thank you. Mean, but w- would you guys be, be willing to, to share? Yeah, we can okay, share. Okay, great. We'll share um, we have a deal. <clears throat> so, because c- uh, I think that would help uh, uh, people uh, developing uh, uh, chatbot or, or generative AI uh, applications. Um, now, l- let's move, uh, uh, move on a little bit. Um, do you see... Um, you know, every company that is, uh, at a certain level, they need to make yearly reports and accountants, uh, uh, accountancy standards and blah, 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 and ESG. Um, and ESG is actually one thing. In your, uh, in the things you guys are doing, um, do you look at, uh, the ESG standards? Because a lot of companies say they're green and we, uh, we have no this and we have no that. We have no child labor. Now we know there's uh, stuff happening in Africa with open AI. Nobody knows exactly what it is. <clears throat> and if it's children or grown-ups, we don't know. Um, but we know uh, these models use a lot, a lot of electricity and clean water. By no means they're green, right? So, um, um, would you or do you see that um, th- there's going to be like an uh, analysis, like you guys are doing, um, of the AI, where, where you say, okay, we understand you're using this. This is not green. You cannot say you're green in your yearly report. Or you need to change X, Y, Z in order to be able to say you're green, um, because otherwise, otherwise you're fooling investors or um, um, customers or what have you. Uh, and I, I think that's one of the things also uh, on board level they do not understand that if you use an example like OpenAI, uh, but that's just one example. I'm, I'm not picking on them, by the way. Um, that the, if you use Microsoft Copilot. Right. If you introduce that in your company, then by no means you're green anymore. Right. And and imagine that in Word, everything you do is is using is a is a thing being sent to OpenAI and then uh, uh, being sent back. That that gener- and you have a company of a couple of thousand people. That's enormous. Yeah. Every prompt will have a, a monetary <laughs> cost fixated to it. Yeah. Um, I, I do believe Not that. only a monetary cost, but a, 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 a green cost uh, uh, because it's yeah. using electricity and it's using water. Measuring that. So measuring how do you that, view that? We, we view that pretty, pretty uh, in line with the UX, pretty extensive. Uh, well, we think it's any of the environmental damage needs to be taken very, uh, very seriously. And it is something which is actually embedded in the legislation. I think one of the recitals actually talks about having uh, key performance indicators with respect to energy consumption and how an AI system performs against the sustainable development goals. Therefore, the the onerous to comply with ESG, whilst not, it doesn't expressly say it has to comply with ESG, it's it's sort of implied in that sense. But um, yeah, companies, if they, if they want to avoid being greenwashed, to avoid greenwashing, they will have to demonstrate that. And if I may, I'd like to add a, uh, so we, sure. look, if we look at the term greenwashing, which is a, effectively stating how environmental or green your product is, which is, may not be the case. There's something which we've coined AI washing, which is effectively company saying our AI system is very safe. It's secure and it's very trustworthy or it's very transparent, et cetera. And it's not. So the parallel, there's a parallel between AI washing and greenwashing. 
So um, uh, I understand this par parallel, and I think it's it's a great term, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised it's going to be used a lot because uh, we know it's been used to get funding uh, to AI wash your startup, and because uh, um, now they're getting more sensible about it. But in the last, I don't know, twelve months, if if you had AI in your startup, then uh, you were sure of funding. Um, and a lot of them sort of were debunked by, uh, by open AI, uh, where they, uh, introduced their own bots where, which a lot of the startups are, you know, they have no role, uh, to be honest, or no business model anymore. Um, and that's the other thing, by the way, if you, you're fully dependent on one LLM, your, I think your business model is very risky. Um, yes. but, but that's my personal opinion. Um, uh, but, but how do you, because you say AI washing, but uh, uh, as a company, and I understand that could also on the stock market boost your uh, your stock value. Mm. Um, so how do you prevent that? Because if you're using AI in your company, it's not a lie. We're using AI. We're using Copilot. We're using mm. this. We're using that. So how do you um, how do you put it at a level where it's actually at? So if you can say you're using AI, but it could have no real function in boosting productivity or improving quality or lowering cost. Actually, if you introduce AI, my experience and my view is that in the first X time, you're actually raising cost. You're not lowering cost. You need to, it's structure follows strategy. If your strategy is, I'm, I'm, I'm introducing AI in different parts of my company, as we said, you need a chief AI officer, but you need a, a structure to manage that in all the, layers of your company or layers of your system. So you need people who understand and do this. They're not cheap. So your costs are going to go up. Eventually it's going to go down, but it's going to go up first. Mm -hmm. So how do you, um, how do you show the actual value of the AI you're using to your, your company? How do you do that independently? And I don't think an accountant is the right company to do that, to be honest. That's, oh, that's my opinion because they don't know shit either. Because if an accountant, uh, um, to be honest, if there's one thing that's easily replaced by AI, it's an accountant. <laughs> well, I, so 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 don't tr don't don't trust the accountant. <laughs> Every Sorry. business uh, has to accountant themselves, but um, I, I get your point. I think the best way to answer that is to comply with the EU AI Act, and you're probably going to laugh because I say that, but there's a reason. The the, the principles of the EU Act include accountability and transparency. So it means that you have to visibly demonstrate that you you can explain the results, you provide information. So if you comply with it, there is no there is no escape from um, um, there's no there's limited poss probability of AI washing occurring because you you have to make your results public. Now this very aspect is quite controversial, especially commercially, because it effectively means open AI opening the trunk and disclosing all the information, training their data, how their algorithms work, which is effect also competitive Intel and IP. So there is a very fine balance between complying with the regulation versus staying competitive. And to use your argument earlier, to, to, to remain competitive is the essence of remaining in, innovative or to, to, to become competitive, you have to be innovative. So, but this all relies on transparency, accountability, and these very um, schools of thought are enshrined in the accountancy profession as well. Yeah, but the um, um, does b being transparent does that help me um, actually understand the value it's creating? Because uh, uh, let's say you're, using, you're 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 listed on the stock market, and you say, "Yeah, we're using AI, we're boosting productivity," blah 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 by x percent um, um somehow even if you make stuff uh um transparent what you're doing or how you're doing it and the results it's getting mm -hmm. um i don't think the, the eu ai act tells you um uh, to to monetize the value you're creating i mean so how do you make that transparent because uh, and then and, um you could say okay we make a business case before we do it and we 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 sort of analyze the impact on the business and we, we make some assumptions and, and monitor that to the business case, the actual, the actual result. That, that could be one way of doing it. And you have to make that then transparent and then uh, plot that on the, on the total business. 
Um, I, I don't know. That's just one example, but I, I, I sort of have a hard time getting a feeling of um, how to do that. Like, cause I think a lot of the times um, um, uh, companies romanticize the results um, because implementing AI, it's, it's not easy. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually hard work and it costs a lot of money and it's, it, it, and time and good people. And there are, there are very few people that are capable of doing it. So, uh, there's a lot of bullshit in the market as well. And, uh, and they charge a lot of money for that. So, sorry to say that uh, that's one of the things I see. And that's why a lot of companies sort of don't get results, but they have to say something because they spend a shit load of money. And that's yep. AI washing actually. <laughs> well, the, the, every company has different dynamics. Well, I'd say the best is all reliant on data. Everything has to be data driven. So, and the best way is to prove how productive it is. So I, if I give you an example, BCG did a, did a study, I think, um, in Q4 last year where they actually took two control groups of equally sort of a similar uh, consultants, one using generative AI, one not. And the one that used generative AI was 40% more productive. So then you can actually visibly demonstrate that if they could do X amount of work faster and more productive to the same level of quality, if not higher, and you use their hourly rate as a, as a, as a means to, 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 uh, to cost, to price it up, then you can show two CEOs, this is the effect on the bottom line by using it versus not using it. So by having control groups and it's, it's how science works, right? You have different science, you conduct science experiments on different scenarios to compare results to make the right decision based on data, not a hunch. And I, I fully agree. But now, now comes the key question. Uh, did, did BCG um, um, lower their price to their customers? And I, I probably know the answer. The answer is probably no. Um, so um, uh, if they didn't lower their price, uh, did they fire any consultants? Well, I, think, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if they lowered the price, but I think the consultancy profession, from what I've read over the past few months, everyone's cut the the labor force has been shrunk, and a lot of people have been. There's been a lot of layoffs. I think the big four have suffered immensely from this, um, and that's um, that's also due to corporate governance concerns, which may and may or not be AI related. But I think a lot of consultants have cut it because they can see that the entire business model like every business model is under threat by AI and it is, um, yeah, it is, it is the, the change as Mustafa Suleiman referred to is, it's just coming faster than we thought the, the internet took a, you know, the, it was staggered almost, but then it hit everyone. It was a, a shift overnight. You're like, Oh, okay. The internet said, we can actually, we can actually look for information online and do things a lot quicker. And now it's like, okay, I can write, um, a manifesto or board minutes in seconds than having to, you know, liaise with my secretary or whatever, and it taking hours to do. It is, it's there. It's today. I know it's there. And, 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 and let's get a little bit more philosophical. What is this? Cause what you're describing is, uh, um, uh, it is the reality. I understand that, but, um, it means for the people that, that are still in the company that the pressure on their, you know, what they have to deliver goes up. I mean, my, yeah. my thought would be, or secret wish would be that if we have uh, the work pressure for a lot of people is already extremely high. If you mm -hmm. look at doctors that they, they have a, uh, let's say their contract hours are hundred percent. They're all working 120, 130, 140% and all budgeting is based on that. So there's no way back. I would hope that AI sort of releases the pressure and makes their life a little bit easier, more, a little bit more relaxed. We all should be entitled to have like, enjoy life, uh, work hard, play hard, but also uh, uh, make sure there's enough time to enjoy life. Uh, Cause y you're not uh, living to work, you're working to live, right? Um, at least that, that's the way I view it. Um, so AI is gonna have a huge impact on that. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if society is going to change because of it big time yeah the, the societal shifts are going to be be there and i think but with the with the gains again uh, delivered by ai the expectations go up and i think a lot of companies were from one of the culture is there's been an ethos and i'm sure as soon as i say this you know exactly what i mean exactly what i mean um under promise over deliver so because then you know the customer will always be satisfied 
and you always if the customer's happy everyone's happy right with but with um with ai going up sorry with ai enabling you to perform your job better you to to underperform or to under to to over deliver is going to be expected. That's the new norm. That's the equilibrium. So then, what's the new over delivering? You know, and then when you talk about philosophical, you're verging on if if the cognitive capacities of Homo sapiens has been has been maxed out and AI is superior, then human beings will have to ultimately augment themselves in a different way. I know I'm going a bit off kilter here. Forgive me, but we're talking about bioengineering almost. Um, and we're talking about ways to um, augment the human body to adapt to a world which is yeah d- uh, infused with technology. I think even Mark Andreessen covered in this in his techno utopianist manifesto last year, um, I believe. But um, is that a good thing? Uh, uh, um, is our society improving then, or are we going to have a lot of? Poverty um, or people that are frustrated or don't know what to do with their time. Uh, where are we going? Where are we heading with this? I think we're heading to a, a, the world. The only constant is change. And that's an ethos which um, a very wise person once told me and I hold dearly. And I think we, we have to expect change. I think in a, in a way to to not pursue innovation, to try and drive ways, ways of improvement is is um is not fair to our to our future ancestors um so i think we 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 need to bear that in mind but i think we also need to take care of people's do our best to educate people and to give them the resources so for example if ai literacy is a requirement under the eu act make the means available to to educate people to give them the means to to educate themselves and to to have resources and to create economic opportunities for themselves the same thing happened with the internet and there are there are things that in life that we can control and things that we can't control. And I'm, I can't sit here and tell you honestly that I have the answers to everything because I don't. Um, what I can sincerely hope for is that we're heading towards a society where people become more emotionally attuned to each other, that the, the origins of community return. And we, we, we work together because we realize that if we don't, then this is, this is the, the path, the point of no return. But there's been many technical changes and there's probably going to be a future one. So take obviously what I say with a pinch of salt. No, uh, I find it actually quite beautiful that um, sort of we're, we embrace the new, but sort of keep the, the important stuff of the old or bring it back actually. Cause uh, I think uh, there's a whole generation that does not know how to communicate one-on-one yeah, via phone, but not directly. So there's a, there's an opportunity there. And I, I think if you translate what you're saying, it should be, um, uh, in schools. So uh, the school system and, and, uh, universities, et cetera, they need to change as well, uh, in order to accommodate this societal change. But the problem is it goes so fast that, um, and school system change really slow. Well, that's, yeah, we're going to have to, that may have to change and that, that may mean, you know, from a resource standpoint, maybe it's helping subsidize schools to make sure they've accessed the equipment to everything from infrastructure to applications so they, they can deliver the services better. Because we, we know there's uh, anthropological studies of human beings. You know, we're constantly doing more studies on how humans behave. Neuro, neuroscience is developing at a phenomenal pace. So we're, get, we're becoming more knowledgeable how, how we learn and how child learn, how human beings learn and evolve. So if we've got that covered, then we need to also focus on the means of delivering education and the means of um, information provision and ingestion and analysis so people can then embrace this because it it all boils down to to education. I think, again, um, without without access to this, you're only you're only depriving people um, of the of the of their future purchasing ability. I think that's the economic equivalent. That is actually beautif- beautifully phrased, um, um, a bit philosophical, but I think uh, it is true. Um, but I started the philosophical part, so I have to be honest. <laughs> um, last, <laughs> last two questions uh, before we close off. Um, if you could give a short advice to management slash board level people, so okay, we're, we're at the fringe of implementing, we want to do something with AI, we need to start. Um, what, what first steps, what, what, what should they do? 
Um, and the same thing for companies, startups that are working with AI, you know, before they go to market, what should they do in order to either secure investment or um, give their customers or potential customers a certain comfort level? Uh, these are the same board, pe board level people that they understand, okay, we can do this together. Take it away. Uh, so first, first point, I adopt a two-step process. One, set up an AI task force. And two, um, set up a, um, set, a point is sufficiently trained, competent and experienced people to manage that, to manage the task force. And then um, the work streams and tasks and projects will um, originate organically from that. So to the second point, um, I would suggest two-step process. One, onboarding a, um, a specialist vendor to come in and do a risk, to do an analysis for their firm, which leads to the second point of identifying all the AI systems and risk classifying them to know the extent of their exposure. Um, and then having these, taking the learnings from both of those and embedding it into the uh, software development process. So in the same way that you had philosophies like Agile, Waterfall, and these project man management uh, philosophies in that embedded in working process, making sure the AI regulatory compliance element and the um, other aspects of that are embedded into the embedded into it. So it's natural and it's it's part of the BAU. So it's not it's not a shock to the system. It is part of the system. And, and, and one question popped up. Do you think other countries are going to copy the EU AI Act um, or, or some, make something of the sort so that there, there's sort of one standard in the world, like what happened with GDPR, basically? I think, and I think the AI partners, we collectively hold this view, that it, that will be the case. We foresee the EU Act being the global blueprint of uh, AI regulation um, in the same way GDPR is. So any company, if they comply with it, they can de facto say that this is the highest standard of regulation and it will, you know, will stand the test of any internal audits, fundraising, uh, political political inquiries, or so on and so forth. So, um, and we've actually seen a lot of this. We've advised Singapore, you know, sorry, we've advised um, some delegates in the, the Philippines over how to structure their AI strategy based on the EU AI Act. Various companies at the moment. One of our existing clients is um, you know, when, they, when they did their initial fundraising round, they mentioned the EU AI Act. So we, we've actually had and we've seen real world impact based on the premise that you've just mentioned. Okay, th thank you for that. I think that, that that sort of popped up mind. I thought it would close off with these two previous questions, but uh, um, they sort of followed through. Thank you very much for uh, uh, for this talk. I, I learned a lot, um, and I'm very happy you guys are willing to share some of the checklists to uh, to help the community further uh, implementing AI in a wise way before that. Well, actually, before they implement it, understanding what they're doing, um, and we'll attach it to the post. Um, well, actually, we'll put it on the Google Drive so they can download it. Um, thank you very much. And um, uh, once it's implemented, please come back and uh, we'll talk about the final text and, and see if any big changes came uh, came along. Thank you very much for your time. Great to be on the podcast. Um, you, you know, we're very, very happy to have the conversations like this. And I think you're doing a fantastic job. And please, please keep it up. Oh, thanks. We'll do that. And, uh, well, hope to have you back on the show. Thank you very much, Michael. Bye-bye.